Hello everyone, this is An American Thinks, and we're back with the fifth installment of The Grand Theory of Everything. In part one, we introduced the topic with a character study of Rhaegar Targaryen, and of course, this led us to study Lyanna in part two. In part three, we expanded our review of the Tower of Joy showdown with an examination of the Kingsguard. Finally, in part four, we discussed Ned Stark and the Stark family lineage. I'm building a playlist on this series, and I'll leave a link in the description below in case you need to catch up on anything. Long story short, which is a weird thing to say when discussing A Song of Ice and Fire, I'm building the case that all the people present at the Tower of Joy essentially had the same problem. But there is still one more survivor who we haven't discussed yet. The myth, the man, the legend, Howland Reed. The only man who fought at the Tower of Joy who is still alive. The only lord in the north with a standing invitation to not attend the great feasts at Winterfell. The Cranach man who spent the first half of his life doing everything and the past 20 years doing nothing. The man Winston Churchill referred to as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. How are we ever going to solve the puzzle that is Howland Reed? Well, we're going to give it our best shot today. And oddly enough, this theory video isn't going to feature any trees. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm just joking. There, there's going to be lots of trees. <clears throat> the year is 281 AC, and Howland Reed has a problem. He is getting accosted by three squires on the tourney field at Harrenhal who are calling him horrible things like short. But little did they know that Howland Reed had just spent all winter on the Isle of Faces with the Green Men and knew all kinds of magic, and so he proceeded to be rescued by Lyanna Stark. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. It says it right here. Huh. Well, how does that make any sense? Okay, let's go ahead and start at the beginning. We all know that Howland Reed is a Cranach man from the neck. We know that they are short of stature and reclusive, preferring the setting of their natural environment to cities or other forms of civilization. And we know that the Neck plays a major part of the lore of Westeros, being the second place where the Children of the Forest attempted to stop the advance of the First Men. The Cranach Men are supposed to understand magic that is tied to the nature of their environment, and by this point in the fandom, most readers and theorists seem to generally accept that the Cranach Men are the descendants of human interbreeding with the Children of the Forest. This was really solidified once we all realized that Jojen had the gift of green sight. Really, the foreshadowing has been laid on pretty thick by this point, and a theorist would probably be breaking the mold by suggesting the Cranach men are unrelated to the children of the forest. And this gets way, way more interesting when you consider the stated history of the Neck, which is that it was pretty autonomous until it was conquered by a Rickard Stark centuries ago, who, in turn, took the Marsh King's daughter as his wife. Which means the Starks not only have the blood of the others and the first men, but also the children flowing through their veins. Oh my gosh, the Starks are so OP. But how does all this affect Howland Reed? According to his daughter, Howland Reed grew up hunting, fishing, and loving every day. He supposedly learned Cranachman magic but we never get an explanation as to exactly what that means, or whether it's all hyperbole. But whatever magic he learned in the Neck apparently wasn't enough, because once he came of age, he decided he wanted to visit the Isle of Faces. Yes, THE Isle of Faces. The mysterious island where the Children of the Forest and the First Men made their pact. The place covered in weirwoods that is still protected by the Green Men to this day. The place that is shrouded in mist, making it hard to find, assuming the green men don't try to sink your boat with magical winds or waves, and assuming the Cranach men can even get there in the first place because between the neck and the Isle of Faces are the Freys and a bunch of other Riverland lords who would just as soon kill Cranach men for sport. Well, try telling all that to Helen Reed, because he not only made the journey as a teenager, but he spent all winter on the Isle of Faces with the green men. Yeah. And look at you. What are you doing with your life? Now, there is a lot to unpack in just this one story. Suffice it to say that the journey from the Neck to the Isle of Faces would be incredibly difficult and dangerous for a Cranach man, even for a group of Cranach men, much less a teenager going solo. And this leads me to believe that in much the same way as Rhaegar Targaryen realized what his life's purpose would be and then set about acquiring the means to fulfill it, 
In the same way, Howland Reed didn't randomly decide that one day he would venture off on his epic journey. He was intentionally spending his formative years mastering the bushcraft and the magic of the Kranig men so that when the time was right, he would have the ability to sneak through the riverlands, subsisting off the land and water, and eventually reach the Isle of Faces. But where would Holland have come up with this idea? In my prior theory videos, I suppose that Rhaegar Targaryen developed his life goal through his intellect and his extensive reading, and the ever-beckoning call of the legend of Azor Ahai. However, from what we know, Howland Reed spent the entirety of his formative years in the Neck, and the Neck doesn't appear to be a place with large libraries full of books of history and lore, and of all the things that Mira says of her young father, and to date she's our most reliable source on the subject, reading was not one of them. But we do have POV proof of another source of inspiration for young men in the North, particularly where magic and the children of the forest are involved, and this, as you may have guessed, is the Three-Eyed Crow. The same crow that convinced Bran to journey beyond the wall as a cripple, and who convinced Jojen to go along even though it would lead to his inevitable death, I believe also convinced young Howland Reed to prepare for his great journey to the God's Eye. It would further explain why years later, when learning that Jojen was having his visions of a three-eyed crow, Howland didn't question the meaning of these visions, or doubt their legitimacy, or even their existence at all. He simply took these dreams at face value and sent Jojen and Mira to Winterfell. So now you might say, okay, all this sounds plausible, but what is so important that the Three-Eyed Crow would want Holland Reed to do at the Isle of Faces? At this point, it is very hard to answer this question reliably since we have almost no reliable information about the Isle of Faces or the Green Men. What is passed along to us comes primarily secondhand through Mira, with no first-hand or POV information to speak of. Once A Dance of Dragons was released, and Bran reached the Three-Eyed Crow, we did get much more reliable information on what weirwoods are and what they can do, and it is hard to think of Howland Reed being on an island of weirwoods for a whole winter, and supposedly knowing magic, without having the same kinds of experiences that Bran has started to have but going much further than that descends pretty quickly into conjecture. Fortunately for us, there is more evidence that we can review to try to infer what might have happened on the Isle of Faces, and that is examining Howland's actions afterwards. The first thing we see Howland Reed doing is getting roughed up by three squires at Harrenhal, and supposedly not making much account of himself in the process. But then just a short time after, he apparently makes quite an account of himself as the Knight of the Laughing Tree, when he defeats three knights in particular, including a knight from House Frey. And yes, I will come out and admit that I believe Howland was the Knight of the Laughing Tree. Honestly, the topic could warrant its own theory video, but to summarize the pertinent points, I don't think it's plausible for the alternative jousters to perform the various actions required in order to fit into the role. Any of the Stark siblings come from one of the most prominent families in Westeros, and their absence would have been noted. Any Stark males competing in the tourney would have additionally been noticed if absent. Ned has a POV dream in the dungeons of King's Landing where he specifically recalls the tourney and does not recollect jousting in disguise or any of his brothers doing so. And Lyanna, while noted to be a good horse rider, has not been trained as a professional jouster and isn't noted for being particularly good at disappearing either. Howland Reed, on the other hand, evaded a whole countryside of Riverlanders while traveling to the God's Eye, and while he might not have been a professional jouster, I readily believe that the victories won by the Knight of the Laughing Tree were a feat of magical ability, not of physical ability. And I think this belief is further reinforced once we get to the Tower of Joy. It's worth pointing out that all of Ned's other companions were from noble houses, they were all presumably trained in war and were all veterans of Robert's Rebellion, but somehow they all died during the combat while Ned and the little Cranach man made it to the final showdown. And that brings us to the pivotal point in our story where Arthur Dane is the last Kingsguard left. Ned Stark is against the ropes and Helen Reed did what he did. And what exactly did Howland Reed do? 
Unfortunately, we haven't gotten to the point in the books where Bran might have a chance to witness these events. However, the show does give us an episode where Bran and Bloodraven visit the Weirwood Hive Mind and see what happens, and it could give us some useful hints. Sword of the morning. Father said he was the best swordsman he ever saw. I looked for you on the trident. And we weren't there. And now it begins. No. Now it ends. Okay, so that didn't really pan out. Suffice it to say, I do believe Ned when he says Howland Reed saved his life, but despite what D&D might put on the screen, I don't at all believe it was by stabbing Arthur Dane in the neck. Or, actually perhaps I should say, I don't believe it was only by stabbing Arthur Dane in the neck. The Starks have the genetics, not only of the first men and the others, but also the children of the forest, and as of the Tower of Joy, they now also have the genetics of the dragons following the birth of Jon Snow. This makes Jon Snow Westeros' number one wanted man for anyone paying attention to the deeper genetic plot lines on this continent. But someone had to get Jon Snow out of Targaryen hands, which meant that someone was going to have to defeat the Kingsguard, which meant that someone was going to have to be able to beat Arthur Dane and his magical sword, Dawn. And that someone was not Ned Stark. It was Howland Reed, the man with the quest to find the Isle of Faces, a quest which culminated with the Tower of Joy and the birth of Jon Snow. And since Ned survived the combat at the Tower of Joy, he not only brought Jon Snow back to Winterfell with him, where John would grow up as a bastard with a fairly high probability of taking the black and moving to the wall, Ned also was able to procreate with Catelyn Tully and produce a whole crop of Stark children with varying degrees of skin-changing abilities, including Bran Stark, who appears to be the most powerful of them all and who would eventually be groomed as Bloodraven's heir. And what did Howland Reed do after taking down the biggest badass in the Seven Kingdoms? Well, he went back home and did nothing. He just sits there, I guess, living happily ever after. Uh, but wait, I said at the beginning of this theory that Holland Reed has a problem. And I didn't even mention it for the rest of the video. Does Holland Reed have a problem? Oh, yes. Yes, he does. And it's not only the same problem that Rhaegar has, and Lyanna has, and the Kingsguard, and Ned. It's the same problem that Jamie Lannister has, and that Joffrey Baratheon has, and Brienne, and Osha, and One One, and Merit Frey. And you may have thought that I was building up to some kind of conclusion here, but we only just laid the foundation for this theory, and we are going to blow the doors off of it in part six. Oh, and by the way, no, I don't believe Howland Reed is the High Sparrow. But, Howland Reed is said to have worn bronze armor at a time when iron or steel armor are readily available and have superior physical properties compared to bronze. Keep this in mind, as it just might come up later in this theory. <laughs> 